Today I was asked to give a kind of uh, historical overview of how Goblet came into being, um, which sort of echoes some of what Eric was saying yesterday about the importance of not losing our collective knowledge of the past. Um, although sadly today I, I'm afraid I don't have any movies for you. Um, so, so please bear with me. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how and why Goblet happened um, and about a vision for bioinformatics training without borders. I'll briefly review uh, some of the main achievements of Goblet um, since Goblet was created um, and finish with a few reflections. Um, I have to apologize in advance because some of my slides repeat what you heard yesterday from Domenica and Celia. I had to remind myself that I wasn't doing an executive board report. Um, and they also touch on some of what Mario Claude was telling you um, about the practical guides. So I'll try to go through those as quickly as possible. So here we are. Um, it's hard to believe that we're celebrating the 10th annual meeting of Goblet. I mean, how on earth did that happen? Um, of course, each of us will have experienced a rather different journey with Goblet. Um, we've all had very different memories, but in the next few slides, I want to try to share some of my recollections of how and why Goblet got started. I suppose for me, perhaps the earliest seed was a an email I received in autumn 2007, uh, inviting me to attend a meeting in Hingston um, and thereafter to submit an expression of interest to join a European infra infrastructure bioinformatics preparatory project. So this of course was the Elixir preparatory phase and I was specifically invited to join Elixir's training strategy committee. The training strategy committee was work package 11 um, of the preparatory phase. Um, and if you could read this, I don't know whether you can, you'll probably recognize some of the committee members from EBI, CSC, IGC, and so on. At the end of the preparatory phase, we made a set of recommendations um, for a coordinated approach to bioinformatics user training in Europe. So note that the focus here was on user training, not education, because at that time the brief was really about delivering informal training on how to use what were to become Elixir's core tools and resources. So our recommendations in that report could be still down into the following, to build a training registry for trainers to share expertise and materials and for trainees to find suitable courses, to develop benchmarking and evaluation systems, to facilitate development of new programs and integration with existing in initiatives, and to provide a forum for interaction with other European training infrastructures. Those recommendations were informed, at least in part, by another project that ran in parallel with the preparatory phase. Some of you may remember this was SLING. This, which was, stands for Serving Life Science Information for the Next Generation. A group of, um, I guess, again, familiar trainers from uh, across Europe were invited to, uh, to attend the first SLING training networking session in November 2009. That date is significant um, because, well, it, it's why subsequent Goblet AGMs were originally scheduled in November. So those annual sling training networking sessions became a force in their own right. Um, those who attended them felt they were sufficiently valuable to establish a bioinformatics training network, the BTN. Importantly, the BTN wasn't just a talking shop. Each meeting set targets, led to actions, publications and so on, and ultimately fed into the sling end of project deliverable, which is bioinformatics training for life sciences, scientists, guidelines of best practice. So the em emphasis on SLING and the BTN was much more on trainers and sharing their experiences um, than user training. But there was a problem. Um, the SLING project and hence the BTN ran out of funds around August 2012 and the preparatory phase was also due to end shortly afterwards. So what next? How could we sustain the training network? More importantly, as then the chair of MNET, I wanted to know how we could um, be more inclusive 
of global trainers and training initiatives. It was clear that we were part of a global web of related organizations, and we reasoned that the challenges faced by MNET were probably very similar to those faced by other organizations. The question was, could there be efficiency gains in sharing those struggles, our expertise, experiences and resources to make those efforts more joined up and more visible? Could we create an umbrella group offering services and support for bioinformaticians, computational biologists, biocurators and so on, working towards common solutions with organizations with overlapping interests? We argued that such a strategic group would be uniquely placed to gain an overview of bioinformatics training needs, activities and developments across the globe. And if we got it right, we might even be able to address some of those issues in a coordinated way. Hence on the 2nd of June in 2012, alongside the MNET AGM in Uppsala, we organized a one day meeting focusing on worldwide training initiatives. So at this meeting, participants were invite, invited to share their training experiences, their challenges and their solutions. So representatives of nine other national and international societies and European projects and networks, including the BTN, came along and talked about their experiences. It was a very positive and constructive meeting at the end of which the participants agreed to join forces to establish a new community-led self-funded organization to help sustain our collective training efforts, to put global bioinformatics training on the map and get trainers' efforts recognized. Capitalizing on the energy of that meeting, we agreed to act swiftly, giving ourselves six months to draw up and sign an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, to create a new organization, to agree, to agree a name, uh, we had several very interesting suggestions um, in, in the weeks that followed. Um, to create a placeholder website, to register the organisation as a legal foundation, then to draw up an, uh, draft an open letter describing the foundation and inviting other people to join, and finally to convene a kickoff event in November 2012. So after some collective agonizing, we eventually came up with a new name. This was Goblet um, and um, a rather inferior logo. Um, as agreed, we, we, had, we drafted the MOU um, to which the 10 participating organizations um, and project representatives uh, were signatories. So that's them there at the, at the head of the MOU. Um, the MOU proposed that Goblet would coordinate worldwide bioinformatics training initiatives by, amongst other things, organizing international events, acquiring funds to support various activities, and providing a joint community-based web portal for training information, materials, tools, and so on, open to international bioinformatics teachers and students to maximize the synergy and value derivable from investments and efforts made in local initiatives worldwide. The signatories agreed to work together to establish and operate Goblet according to the activities outlined in the, in the MOU. That MOU came into force on the 6th of, the, of July with its fifth signature. Um, and it was eventually signed by all the representatives. So as you can see, we really did move very, very quickly. This was only four or five weeks after that meeting in Uppsala. So Goblet, Goblet was finally established as a legal foundation by the community, for the community, as Celia said yesterday, a globally coordinated network of training resource and training resource possessed by nobody and owned by everybody. So this was really important that we all had ownership um, of Goblet. So a kickoff meeting was convened in Amsterdam on the 28th of November in 2012, hosted by ENBIC, and the formal sticking documents were handed over during that meeting, registering an acting executive board comprising Allegra Via as secretary, Celia van Gelder as treasurer, myself in the chair, and Barbara van Kampen as a member. Alongside the founders, 10 other organizations had agreed to become members and some of their representatives attended the meeting. 
CSC also attended as observers. So those are all the, the members um, at that time, or by that time, and these were the meeting participants. So Goblet then officially came into being in November 2012, a few months before Elixir's implementation phase, which started in early 2013. One of Elixir's immediate tasks was to attract new nodes, amongst which was Elixir UK. Some of you may remember that for political reasons, Elixir UK was initially mandated to be a training node. So its first project was to create a platform to coordinate training information across the Elixir landscape. This was the training e-support system, TESS. So it's quickly evident that there were significant overlaps, as you might expect, um, between the training activities of Goblet and Elixir. So in 2015, a joint training strategy uh, was articulated in order to, explicit, to explicitly define areas of joint activity so that it wasn't sort of mission creep between the organisations. So these were to work together on Elixir and TESS, um, Elixir TESS and Goblet's training portal, um, to collaborate on train the trainer and train the researcher activities, um, to explore accreditation mechanisms, um, and to share best practices to professionalize training. Um, I don't propose to dwell too much on Elixir here, um, but just wanted to add that around this time or, or, or soon after, uh, the Elixir Accelerate project was funded. And from there, the Elixir training platform um, was created. Uh, which provided a coordinating hub for Elixir's training activities and a central point of contact for Goblet. Shortly after that, TESS was finally accepted as a core Elixir resource. Um, and I'll come back to the importance of that um, in a while. So what has Goblet achieved? Well, I won't list all of the achievements, but some of them are worth mentioning. This slide gives a flavor of just a few of the strategic alliances that Goblet has formed and I'll highlight just a couple here, including input to the CoData RDA, RDA Annual Research Data Summer Schools uh, in Trieste, input to the HDA Bionet Education Summits, which you heard about yesterday, work with ISCB to create the first poster track for education at ISMB, and thence to create the Education Community of Special Interest, which ultimately was included in the main conference programme, so that was a significant achievement. Input to the Bioschemas Initiative to develop standards for describing training resources to make them more discoverable, and I'm actually keen to know how that's progressing. Um, work with MNET, SIB, Elixir and so on to create a range of new training materials, which we'll take a, a closer look at in the next slides. Development of those, of those materials, as you heard from Domenica yesterday, was made possible by a donation from MNET to fund a two-year project, which started on the 1st of August 2017, to create standard, professionalised training resources. Amongst the materials to, to be developed were a set of critical guides on popular bioinformatics tools and resources as part of an introduction to bioinformatics series. The motivation here um, was to produce tangible branded products and to encourage best practices in developing training materials. As Domenica mentioned, these were inspired by MNET's quick guides for users of basic bioinformatics tools and databases, but with the, addition, uh, the additional element of, of critical thinking. Some of the design concepts, the logo, the color palette and so on, were provided by Antonio Santavito, while the layout and standard components were informed by the higher apprenticeship specification for college level students in England, which at that time was a recognized standard. So far, seven critical guides have been developed, including those on Unix, Blast and so on. And note that each guide bears the Goblet endorsement logo. There was also a set of practical guides for high school teachers in the Bringing Bioinformatics into the Classroom series. These have a slightly different look and feel, pitched at a slightly different level. Um, 
and they include um, many more hands-on exercises than the critical guides. To date, we've produced five practical guides, including the most recent on SARS, COV-2, as you, uh, but as you heard about these uh, yesterday from Mary Claude, I'll not, not say more about them here. Newest of all is a set of professional guides for training trainers as part of the Resources for Trainers series. Only one of these has been published so far. That's the one on course design, considerations for trainers. Close to completion, as I mentioned yesterday, is an introduction to the mastery rubric for bioinformatics. And that's hopefully to be followed by a guide on how to use the mastery rubric for bioinformatics. So the aim of these guides really is to try to demystify the mastery rubric for bioinformatics and to show how it can help both to inform course design and to facilitate your own professional development and that of your students. And finally, currently in the pipeline are existing modules from the Elixir Goblet Train the Trainer package, starting with principles of learning and how they apply to training. So investment in the education project gave Goblet a set of tangible products, evidence of the organization's work to professionalize and standardize training resources. The guides have proved very popular, um, particularly at conferences, and all have pu been published in the F1000 Bioinformatics Education and Training Collection, where they're frequently viewed and downloaded, as Marie Claude mentioned yesterday. So here you can see the statistics for the first seven critical guides, the first six of which were published in September 2018, and the seventh in June 2019. As you can see, the most viewed are the PDB and Uniproc guides, while the most downloaded are the Unix and BLAST guides. Not quite sure why, but it's an interesting observation. So here are the statistics for the five practical guides published between March 2019 and August this year, uh, alongside the first professional guide, which was published in November 2020. The most viewed and downloaded practical guide is the one on using bioinformatics to understand genetic diseases. That was Marie Claude's first guide. The most recent is the one on, on SARS-CoV-2, which again, you heard from, about from Marie Claude yesterday. For me, what's interesting is that the professional guide to course design, um, which was published more than 18 months after the first practical guide already has more or less the same viewing and download statistics as the power of computers in biology, uh, which is essentially an introduction to the Raspberry Pi. So this seems to suggest that there's an appetite for the professional guides for trainers. If you place them side by side, you can see that the practical and professional guides appear to be the most popular overall, possibly because there are fewer resources out there that are aimed directly at high school teachers and trainers. To my mind, at least, this demonstrates the importance of creating and investing in product, projects that provide new resources for teachers and trainers, and to which members can contribute and feel proud. Um, and here, as ever, collaboration is key. These guides are the result of work with Marie Claude and colleagues at SIB, with Daniel Barker and Stevie Bain from Edinburgh University, Allegra Via, Jessica Linval, Patricia Pelagi from Elixir, and Rochelle Trachtenberg from Georgetown University. So I would urge anyone uh, who has training materials for high school teachers or materials for trainers to work with Goblet to develop new guides to accompany their courses and to disseminate them via F1000. I mentioned earlier that the success or appeal of the BTN um, meetings was at least in part that they weren't just talking shops but generally they led to real actions, including publications. Well, Goblet uh, endeavoured to continue um, with that tradition and to publish its, its work either alone or in collaboration with others, with Elixir, with BD2K and so on, leading overall to around 20 journal publications. I might have missed some. And as already mentioned, all of the guides have also been published in F1000 as part of the Bioinformatics Education and Training Collection. So aside from developing and publishing new training materials and writing journal articles, Goblet has run numerous workshops in, uh, in collaboration with others, including Train the Teacher, Train the Trainer, and Train the Researcher workshops. It's also publicized its work, 
um, via its own and its members' newsletters. And it's also publicised its work via posters and booths at conferences, as you heard from Celia yesterday. Along the way, Gobbler also secured a number of small, small grants, particularly um, those to, from uh, small government grants to support its AGMs. Importantly also, Goblet inaugurated a travel fellowship scheme for young or newcomer speakers at ISMB, at the ISMB Education Cozy. Um, and Vicky Nambuari was the first recipient of that in 2019. Um, and obviously Goblet's done a lot, lot more. So here we are, um, almost 10 years on. Um, looking back, I would say that overall, Goblet's early work centered on building its training portal running training needs surveys and best practice workshops, developing branded materials for train the trainer and train the teacher programs, working with others to articulate metadata standards, publishing and actively publicizing this spectrum of activities in journals, conferences, newsletters, and so on. Along the way, Goblet has forged many synergistic, mutually beneficial, strategically important relationships, leading to many positive results and fruitful cross-fertilizations between organizations. Many issues are clearly too big or too complex um, for individuals or individual organizations to tackle alone. That includes kite marking or certification and accreditation. Tackling these will continue to require input from its members and allied organizations, because the more we work together, the greater the benefits and the more we avoid costly duplication of effort and wasteful invention of multiple standards. I think we've come a long way since 2012. Uh, overall, I'd say that Goblet provides a collective voice for bioinformatics training. Ultimately, it's about building bridges and sharing. Sharing different perspectives, expertise, experiences, and best practices benefits bioinformatics training it helps construct new, new forms of meaning and understanding in ways that are individually and collectively valuable, which new knowledge can then be applied to professional practice. Because working together makes us stronger and better informed, and at the end of the day, it's about collaboration, not competition. And finally, um, Goblet was born into a complex, bioinformatics education and training landscape. As we've seen, some of the seeds grew from the preparatory phase of the S3 infrastructure project Elixir. While Elixir set about amassing its contributor nodes across Europe, MNET convened a meeting of global bioinformatics training providers who went on to create Goblet as a legal foundation. In the months that followed, Many new organizations joined, including several from the UK. The interest from the UK came at least in part because Elixir UK was mandated to become a training node and organizations wanting to join Elixir UK saw advantages in also being part of a worldwide training initiative. And so the lead organization for Elixir UK, CGAT, became a Goblet member having seen that many other Elixir nodes had already joined Goblet. As we saw, Elixir UK's focus was in, increased, was in creating a web-based platform, this was TESS, to harvest training information across Europe. Importantly then, by working closely with TESS, we ultimately ensured that Goblet's training resources were efficiently, that means automatically disseminated across the Elixir landscape. Today, Goblet remains, in, remains embedded within that complex global bioinformatics education and landscape, working hand in hand with its members and strategic partners, Elixir, MNET, ISCB, HCA Bionet, AP Bionet, SIB, to name but a few. It will require continued passion and commitment to sustain Goblet and investment in a shared vision to cultivate the global bioinformatics trainer community, to set standards and provide high quality resources to support learning, education and training. Ultimately, to unite, inspire and equip bioinformatics trainers worldwide. I hope that Goblet will not just set standards, 
but that its members will use them and propagate them. This is about eating your own dog meat. But yeah, sustaining up Mnet and Goblet is a lot of hard work, as Celia rightly observed yesterday. But supporting the global tri trainer community continues to be an extremely worthwhile, worthwhile global issue, one that I hope will continue to have your collective support. On that note, I'll end with the reprise of Goblet's annual meetings, beginning with a planning meeting in Stockholm in June 2012 followed by the 2012 kickoff meeting in Amsterdam. There was an interim meeting in July alongside ISMB in Berlin, then the second annual meeting in Norwich in 2013, the third meeting in Toronto, the fourth in Cape Town in 2015, followed by the fifth in Brisbane in 2016, then moving back to Europe in Portugal, and the seventh back to Toronto um, in 2018. After that was the ninth meeting in Jakarta, which was the first AGM that I ever missed, um, which was a great pity for me. Um, and then the first um, fully virtual meeting in Helsinki last year. I want to congratulate the executive board for keeping Goblet afloat. <laughs> It's no, no, no trivial task. And to say happy anniversary, Goblet. I sincerely hope with your continued investment, there will be many more happy returns. Um, and may this joint Goblet Eminent AGM be the first of many. With that, thank you for your attention. <laughs>